Dr. Steve Schneider. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Uh, I travel all over the world with that film telling my story. And uh, there's really no place I'd rather be this evening than you all. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, in a few minutes. Let me read to you just a little excerpt out of the book. The book's called In My Seat. The film's called In My Seat. This, was, this book was written on the stuff that... Yes. All right. Doing all right? Can you do something? Anything right? No. Can you do good things? Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, sir. I don't even need this thing. I'm going to... You, you say yes, sir. Anyway, all right. I understand. All right. Now let me read to you an excerpt out of the book called In My Seat. The sun beat warmly on Tom McGinnis' shoulders as he finished his pre-flight inspection for American Airlines Flight 11. His early morning duties were made more bearable by the beautiful, sunny New England morning. With the outside of the airplane inspected and prepared, Tom returned to the cockpit to complete his pre-flight brief with Captain John Oganowski. The exterior walk around and brief were as natural to Tom as breathing. He had practiced them so many times that they were second nature, just a part of who he was as a first officer for American Airlines. While the cockpit crew was busy rehearsing their well-practiced takeoff brief, another inhabitant of Flight 11 was busy rehearsing his own takeoff scenario. Muhammad Atta slid into business class seat 8D. The connection from his Portland, Maine flight had been tighter than he would have liked, and now he hurriedly settled into his seat to mentally prepare for the events that would soon follow. He had rehearsed his plan so many times, it was as much a part of him as the pre-flight was part of Tom. He scanned the airplane, making sure that his fellow conspirators were in their places. They were. Between first class and business class, the soon-to-be hijackers filled five seats. All was going according to their plan. Flight attendant Karen Martin and Barbara Arstarby completed their cabin preparations. They checked, the, their, they checked to make sure that everyone's seatbelt was fastened and their tray tables were locked. They examined the seatbelt of Muhammad Atta. His safety was their main concern. Muhammad Atta ex examined the flight attendants as well, but he wasn't concerned for their safety. Rather, he was concerned that they might stand in the way of his plan. To him, they weren't human. They were infidels, and as such, an obstruction to his well-thought-out plan, they would have to die. Two states away in Brunswick, Maine, Steve Scheiber stepped through the door of Wing 5, the headquarters of Commodore of Naval Air Station, uh, Brunswick, Maine, his unexpected day off from flying for American Airlines had provided the opportunity to meet with the Commodore and discuss a new pet project. Good morning, sir, barked the command duty officer as Commander Scheiber stepped through the door. After 18 years in the Navy, the daily greeting and requisite salute were nothing new. He had practiced them so many times that they were ingrained into his being, just a part of who he was as a naval officer. Before stepping into the Commodore's office, Steve prayed a silent prayer for the man behind the door. For you see, that was a part of Steve as well. As a Christian and a pastor of a local church, the Commodore wasn't just his boss. He was a man Steve cared for deeply and upheld in prayer. It didn't take much thought. Praying was stamped into his heart and built into his life. It, too, characterized who he was in every part of his life. Pastor, commander, first officer, husband, and father. Three men, all well-practiced in their chosen professions, all ready to do whatever was necessary to complete their day's mission, all intersected at one horrific moment in time that would change their lives forever. 7.40 a.m., Tom McGinnis dialed clearance delivery on frequency 121.65 to gain pushback clearance. 7.43 a.m., both engines of the Boeing 767 roared to life as Tom called ground control for taxi instruction. 8 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 was cleared for takeoff from Boston Tower. Tom pushed the power levers forward as the engines howled. Passengers and crew alike were pushed back into their seats by the airplane's acceleration. At 143 knots, Captain jo John Oganowski called, rotate. Tom pulled back on the yoke as the flight to Los Angeles began. The flight leveled at 26,000 feet, and Tom engaged the autopilot. 8.13 a.m., Air traffic control instructed the crew to turn 20 degrees right. John replied, American 11, turning 20 degrees right. That would be the cockpit crew's last transmission. Removing his seatbelt, Muhammad Atta rose from his seat. Tom's mission was over. Atta's would now begin. 
For the next 32 minutes, Atta and his co-conspirators carried out their reign of terror. In that time, they would slash the throats of both Tom, John, and stab two flight attendants in first class. They herded the passengers to the rear compartment of the airplane and contained them with mace and pepper spray. They admonished the passengers to cooperate and they would live. That was a lie. 8.46 a.m., gripping the yoke with blood-stained hands and fueled with a fanatical frenzy, Muhammad Atta slammed the huge 767 into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. No one aboard Flight 11 would survive. Three men, three missions. The horrific events of September 11th and the mission of two. But one lived on. And that's where the story really begins. Um, for many of you, the events of September 11th is a historical event. And I'm a historical figure. Because I'm one of the guys that lived through it. And as we get farther and farther away uh, from September 11th, that'll be more and more people, it'll be just uh, something they read about in the history books. But I think something that's very important for us, especially men who wear the uniform, it's important for us to understand our country's history and our role in that. Do you follow me with all that? And so tonight we're going to do something really unique and really special. I'm going to share with you the rest of the story, the stuff you couldn't see in a short 15-minute film, the rest of the story behind the events of, of September 11th. Now before I do that, I want to brag on my oldest boy for a minute. Because uh, as you saw that film, there was a name that came up very quickly at the end of the film. It said a film by Peter Scheiber. Now, I'm Steve Scheiber. I'm the pilot guy. I still work for American Airlines. I'm still in the right seat of the Boeing 767. I've been with American now for 22 years. But Peter Scheiber is my oldest son, and that's who made that film. That film that you just saw has been viewed a little over 2.1 million times on YouTube. It's been viewed in every country around the world, uh, and that's absolutely a god thing, because the message of that film is unique to a YouTube film. It's not your typical 30-second you know, funny thing on YouTube. It's actually a serious 15-minute investment that you just saw. Now, with that in mind, uh, I want to share with you just a couple of things, because I get asked two questions primarily. And the two questions I've been asked over the last 12 years now are, number one, how do you like flying airplanes? And how has your life changed since the events of 9-11? And the one question is a whole lot easier to answer than the other. Uh, I love flying airplanes, and uh, uh, most guys that fly a, a, an airplane for a living will tell you they love what they do for a living. In fact, I can't believe I get paid to stare out the window, uh, but I do. Some of you in this room, you guys will be airline pilots someday. You'll be, you'll join the military, you'll be military pilots, that's how you get your training. You'll end up working for American or United or Delta or one of those airlines someday. Uh, and it's really a privileged job. I really enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, but quite honestly, uh, the job is pretty boring. I gotta admit, it's, in fact, it's 99% boring, punctuated by 1% sheer terror, okay? And you guys just saw the 1% sheer terror on your screen, but the other 99% of what I do is trying to stay awake and kind of fight fatigue. And you can picture it, can't you? You know, you're sitting up there in the cockpit, and you're staring at the instruments, and they're staring back at you, and there's not a whole lot going on. And the sun's beating on you through the window. And sometimes you feel like an old lizard on a rock in the summer. And, uh, some funny things happen in those moments. You guys know what it's like. You know, you get back to your dorm room, and things get kind of boring, and some funny, funny things happen. So uh, to illustrate my, my point about the silly things that happen, this is about know, seven or eight years ago. I'm uh, at 37,000 feet, coming back from Los Angeles to Boston. And I think we were somewhere over Kansas, because I'm staring out the window, and I started counting all the crop circles down below on the ground. All right, that's a bad idea. When you're tired, it's like counting sheep. You know, the next thing, your head's going to hit the dashboard. And as I'm counting all these crop circles, staring out the window, all of a sudden, a thought occurred to me that I hadn't thought about decades, and it was funny, and it caught me off guard. So I started laughing. I started laughing so hard I started losing. You ever had that happen to you? Right? You're in a crowd of people and you're laughing and everybody's like, dude, what's your problem? You know? And uh, you're, you're trying to get it out, but you can't. So every 30 seconds or so, the captain would say to me, Steve, what in the world is so funny? And I, I try to get it out, and another wave would laugh and just crash over. So this goes on for an eternity. When you're in a belly laugh, like three minutes is a really long time. So at the end of three minutes, I finally calmed down one more time. And this last time, the captain said to me, Steve, what in the world is so funny? I said, all right, are you ready? Mrs. McWilliams, he looked at me like you're looking at me right now. Like, what in the world? I said, let me explain Mrs. McWilliams. Mrs. McWilliams was my fourth grade teacher, and she was not a nice lady. In fact, this gal was mean and rotten to the court, right? 
And uh, now I know that there may be some teachers in the room, folks in the back. There may be some teachers in the room. And I think that what you do for a living is fantastic. But like one out of every 100,000 teachers all look for something else to do for a living, okay? That was Mrs. McWilliams. She had these three rulers that she had taped together. She used that thing like an assault weapon in the classroom. <laughs> you never saw this lady come to either. She would troll around in the back of the classroom. And if your fingers were over the edge of the desk like that, that was one of her pet peeves. So she'd sneak up behind you and she'd take that sticker and she'd whack your knuckles for all she was doing. Man, that hurts. I want you guys to come into the classroom. You're eight years old. You're a boy. Not hard to imagine. You're, it's just outside Detroit, Michigan. And it's early November. And the first snow of the season is just starting to gently fall outside. Where do you guys want to be right now? Right? Trapped with Mrs. McWilliams? Yeah, right? Or outside with the first snow. Now, the first I realized that this lady was somewhere in my vicinity was when the pain radiated from the side of my leg up to my brain. And then as she leaned up, she whacked me in the side of the leg, and she leaned over and she hissed this in my ear, and I'll never forget what she said. She said, Stevie Shiver, you'll never make a living staring out the window. <laughs> Seven of the remaining eleven disciples. What's that lesson he's trying to teach them? 
I think he was trying to teach me, and I believe he's trying to teach us tonight. The lesson is pretty simple. He needs to get them and me and us to stop living like someday saints and start living more like borrowed time believers. What's the difference between a someday saint and a borrowed time believer? Well, a someday saint is that museum piece of a Christian or a person who's always going to get around to it someday. Whatever it is that God wants them to do with their lives, they're going to do it someday. They're just not going to do it today. They keep God at arm's length. They're the king and queen of the procrastinators. Why do they do that? Well, because they've got a plan for their day and their week and their month and their life. And they're not sure that God's plan fits into their plan. You see how that works? But a borrowed time believer is different. They live every day with a sense of urgency and purpose and passion. They know that every day on this earth is a precious gift from God. And as I'm looking out into the face of young men, guys, I see something. I see that you guys have a lot of days, potentially a lot of days left on this earth. And you want to get the most out of those days. And I want you to get the most out of those days. But not the most for you. The most for the bigger picture, the cause of Christ, the kingdom of God. Something that you get plugged into that gives you purpose and significance. Does that make sense to you? You see, you can live life for yourself. And in this what's in it for me world, take care of number one first world. It's easy to get caught up in that. And never get plugged into something bigger than yourself. For me, my significance and my purpose in life has been found first and foremost as a Christian man, plugged into God, then plugged into the, my family, then plugged into the military. All those things gave me a bigger picture than I had before. It allowed me to live like a borrowed time, to leave the sense of urgency. So I was going to get them and me and us to move from that someday Saint mentality to this borrowed time believer sense of passion and urgency. Well, he's going to ask us three questions. And here's the first. What are you doing here? Right? I'm not talking about in this room today. And by the way, Jesus doesn't utter anything in the first four verses. He just simply shows up on the beach. He implies the question, what are you doing here? But when he first called these men to be his followers, he called them to become fishers of what? Fishers of men. So now, seven of the eleven men on the planet Earth that are qualified to become fishers of men are now back in the boat fishing for what? Fish. All right? Now, guys, there's nothing wrong with fishing for fish. It's not an appropriate use of their time right now. And so Jesus is implying the question, what are you doing here on this Earth? What are you plugged into? What's bigger than you? Where are you going to find your purpose? What's your significance in this life? Or is this all about you and the accumulation of stuff? In good times? An important question. Now the second question comes on the heels of the first. In verse 5, Jesus speaks for the first time and he says this. So Jesus said to uh, them, he yells from the beach, he goes, Children, do you have any fish? Now do you ever wonder why God ever asks a question? All right. Let that sink in for a minute. He doesn't have to ask a question because he already knows the answer. Anytime God asks a question, it's always for our benefit, not for and you also know what it's like when you're cold and tired and cranky and hungry and maybe a little bit embarrassed and you want to cut off the conversation. Don't you give that kind of snippy one-word answer? All right? So one of the guys yells this back in the book. No! Wow. I don't know about you, but aren't you glad God doesn't accept no for an answer? Think about where you're walking with God when he accepted no for the first time. So I picture Jesus now just puts a smile on his face. He's going to begin to walk these guys back down memory lane. He says, hey, take that net you've got in the boat and throw it out on the other side. Three years prior to this, when he first called Peter back in Luke chapter 5, Peter had been out fishing all night, hadn't caught a single thing. Jesus shows up for the first time and says, come be a fisher of men, right? But take that net and throw it out on the other side of the boat. Peter does so. It fills up with fish so quickly he can hardly haul it in. There's only one guy that fishes like this, by the way, and that's Jesus. So in John 21, they throw the net on the other side again. It fills up with fish so quickly they can hardly haul it in. Peter gets so excited now because he knows who it is on the beach. He jumps out of the boat and he swims to shore. That's pretty exciting. He shows up on the beach now soaking wet. He goes and he greets the Lord. The other guys are rowing the boat back, you know, pulling that heavy net with all the fish in it. You know, thanks a lot, Peter. And, you know, they finally make it back to the beach. And, and, uh, but Peter's a good guy because those other guys, they need to go greet the Lord as well. So they get out of the boat and they're going to say hi to Jesus. And Peter grabs those nets and he's pulling them up on the shore. And he gets them up. Peter's a sturdy guy. He gets them up farther and farther. And, and uh, you can hear the fish flopping around. You can smell the fish in your nostrils. You can see the fish flopping around in the nets. Peter now is reunited 
with the resurrected God of the universe. I want to put this in perspective for you. The resurrected God of the universe. Jesus Christ has defeated the grave. Peter can see the holes in his hands. He can see the hole where the spear went into his side. He can see the scarring on his face from the thorn of, crown of thorns. He can see all of that. Peter is right there with the resurrected God of the universe. What a moment that's going to be for us. At that moment, Peter stops to take time to count the fish. Does that strike you as odd? Verse 11 it tells us there's 153 large fish in the nets. I think it gives us some insight to Peter's mindset. Peter loves God. Don't get me wrong. Steve loves God. Right? But like those fish, that in a day or two or three, they're going to begin to rot and smell and decay, and then you've got to go out and do it all over again. Gentlemen, you got a whole life worth of work ahead of you. The things that are temporary in life, we pursue at the expense of that, which is what? Eternal. See, we get our priorities all wrong. We get plugged in to the wrong things, the things that are temporary instead of the things that are eternal. So the second question this evening is this. What are you fishing for in life, really? What are you doing here on this earth? What are you fishing for in this life, really? Are you going to leave this planet a better place for the cause of Christ? Or is this all about you? What are you fishing for in life? Now, I love verse 12, because it's what I call man breakfast. You guys will understand this one. Verse 12 says this. Jesus uh, came and he says, come and have breakfast to the disciples that were there. But it says, none of the disciples ventured to ask him, who are you? Because they all knew it was the Lord. Now, this is what I call man breakfast. And uh, my wife and my daughters, they don't understand man breakfast. Because if they come along, there's, it's no longer man breakfast, because there's women. Uh, but when men go out and have breakfast together, um, there's no talking required. In fact, you can have a great time and just grunt at each other like a bunch of cavemen for the better part of a half an hour. Or engage in trash talk. You guys know what that's all about, right? Where you lower the other guy to elevate yourself. It's extremely juvenile, but very masculine. Right? And so here you got a bunch of men all having man breakfast together. And it says that nobody's talking at this man breakfast. All you can hear is the fish flopping around in the nets, and that's about it. Jesus now begins to serve breakfast. When did Peter and the other guys ever get it? When did it finally click for those guys that Jesus was who he said he was? I believe they all got it in verse 13. Let me read to verse 13 to you. It says, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. Now, we already know what's on the menu. We've been told a couple times bread right and fish. What's so significant about verse 13? It's because of the action that goes with it. Gentlemen, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of these seven men just for a couple of minutes. For you, when was the last time Jesus took a piece of bread and broke it and handed it to you? If you know your Bible, it was about a week ago for you. There's a place called the Upper Room. We call it the Last Supper. Last time Jesus took a piece of bread and broke it and handed it to you, what did he say? He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you gather together in remembrance of me. Nothing in there about going fishing for fish. Everything in there about going fishing for men. Everything in there about abandoning the someday saint mentality and living more like a borrowed time believer with a sense of urgency and passion. Everything these men needed was right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And without a word, in John 21, Jesus delivers the most brilliant message yet. He takes a piece of bread and breaks it and looks them in the eye one after another. And I'm telling you guys, these men got it in verse 13. If it had been me at that scene, I probably would have cried like a little baby. These men got it in verse 13. Now to drive the point home, Jesus turns his attention to Peter. And in verse 15, 16, and 17, he asks him that famous question. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now the these that Jesus is referring to, nobody really knows what he's talking about. It could be the other men that are there. It could be the distractions of life, because Peter's pretty distracted. Or it could be the 153 large fish flopping around in the nets during our silent man breakfast. It's hard to say what it is. The point is this. If there's something you love more than Jesus, that's a problem. And that's what Jesus is trying to communicate to Peter and the others, and to me, and to us. Is there something in life that you love more than Jesus? And maybe that something in life is you. Maybe you love you more than you love God. If you do, you're pursuing that which is temporary at the expense of that which is 
you turn on. You got your priorities wrong. You're plugged into the wrong thing. You see, God brought all three of these questions into my life on September 11th, 2001. How did he bring those three questions into my life? By showing me my own mortality. I'm here this evening to tell you, I know what it's like to have somebody die in my place. Not once, but twice. And once was enough. You see, Tom, the pilot who bumped me off the flight that day, he'd be the first guy to tell you that he did not die for my sins. Now, how can I say that with confidence? Here's the silver lining on this little dark story. Tom had a solid testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. When Tom was 17 years old, about the same time I did, Tom surrendered his life to Jesus Christ for the very first time. And on September 11, 2001, Tom didn't expect to go meet the Lord that day. But on September 11, 2001, Tom went straight from that bloody cockpit, straight into the arms of the Lord. Why? Because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary? Because Tom received Jesus Christ when he was a young man. But the other who died in my place, the other who died in Tom's place, the other who died in your place, was far more significant. The Lord Jesus Christ hung and bled and suffered on a cross to pay a price that he and he alone was uniquely qualified to pay. Tom and I could have swapped out for each other on any given day. We were both qualified to sit in the same seat. But only one's ever been qualified to go to the cross of Calvary and pay the price that he could pay and he alone could pay. So that you and I could be right with God again. Why did Jesus Christ go to the cross and die such a humiliating death for you? Two reasons, really. Number one, out of faithful obedience to God the Father. That's how much he loves God. And out of a deep and abiding passion for you and I the object of his love. That's how much he loves you. You go, know, Steve, um, I don't think God could love me. I hear what you're saying, but if you knew the stuff that I've done and the stuff I'm into, I, I don't think God could love me. Can I put that in perspective for you, gentlemen? God's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows every sin you've ever committed. He knows every sin you're currently committing. He knows every sin you'll ever commit for the rest of your life. And he still sent his son to the cross, knowing all of that ahead of time. That's how much he loves you. How can you keep that type of love at arm's length, like a someday saint? That type of love requires, even demands, a response on our part. What are you doing here? What are you fishing for in this life, really? And what do you love more than Jesus? And by the way, there's nothing in this universe that Jesus loves more than you. He's already proven that on the cross of Calvary. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege it is to be able to share my God story this evening. And Lord, you know I was reluctant to go out and share this because I, I don't really like talking about myself. But Lord, a couple of years ago you shoved me out the door and said, Steve, it's not your story, it's my story through your set of circumstances. And Lord, as I'm looking at these young men, I'm thinking, wow, there's a lot of God stories to be told here. And for some, that story needs to begin. It needs to have an opening chapter. For others, it's already started, but it's uh, uh, you're, you're helping them turn the pages of their lives and write that story. Lord, I'm wondering about those three questions this evening, how we would wrestle with the big picture issues of life. What are we getting plugged into that's bigger and more significant than ourselves? Lord, as I look at men that are in uniform, I understand that they understand what it's like to get plugged into something bigger than themselves. Lord, I pray that they would not keep you at arm's length, but in fact would embrace you as the most important and significant surrender that they could ever make in their lives. Lord, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to contemplate and to think about these questions tonight, even if we get to the busyness of what's coming next. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being able to dwell with you this evening for just a little bit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Chapel.